So I'm starting a uh, two-part series. Pastor Brian is away and Pastor Lynette are away on a much-deserved and much-needed uh, vacation and a rest. So they'll come back all rested and ready. So I'll be praying for them as they're uh, taking this time to rest up and recharge, which is a great thing. Uh, so as Pastor Brian is away, we're taking a break from his summer sermon series, and I'm going to be delivering a two-part mini-series entitled Faith Works from the Book of James. So if you want to find James in your Bible, that'd be a great start for you. And while you're turning there, James is uh, known as the younger brother of Jesus. Many believe is the oldest of Jesus' younger brothers. And like, and I resonate with James as a younger brother, because what you'll find as you get to the book of James is that just like most younger brothers, he doesn't want to give his older brother that much credit, but he gives him a couple shout-outs. Because in James, as you see in your notes, uh, two times he mentions Jesus, but really the whole book is seeing and uh, we'll see James uh, learning from and listening to his big brother Jesus. Um, so here's today's sermon title, Doers of the Word. As James is going to tell us that we would be uh, both knowing the word and doing the word. Knowing what God is saying to us, and then doing what he has told us to do. James is a good book if you want just instruction on what to do, because more more than, or about half of the verses tell us something to do. Do this, do this, do this. James is wanting us to be knowing the word and doing the word, something that he learned from Jesus, because Jesus, at the end of his uh, most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, said, uh, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, knowing the word, doing the word, is like a wise man who dug deep and built his house on the rock. So James, learning from Jesus, is uh, wanting those who read this letter to know you should be knowing the word and doing the word. So for today and for this series, uh, that's really where we're going to land back at, knowing the word, doing the word, the balance between knowing the word and doing the word. So for the purposes of our uh, two-part series, this is our theme verse, and essentially is the theme verse for the book of James. We read it earlier. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. James is concerned that we know the word, do the word. He's not concerned to say that our works will lead us into salvation. He's concerned to tell us that our faith, our faith in God, Our trust in him and who he is will naturally overflow into the works. So he is not saying you need to add works to a list of things to do so that you can find Jesus. He's saying that our faith in Jesus will overflow into our works, knowing the word and doing the word. Now, as it's getting nicer out there, uh, one of the things our family loves to do, or at least a few of us that can actually do this right now, is ride bikes. So here's us riding our bikes. I can't really, it keeps blinking. Is it blinking to you? No? Okay. So we're not all blinking. Uh, So here's us riding our bikes. We do it to church sometimes. In the summer, I encourage you to uh, join us one Sunday in the summer. Just ride your bike to church. See how that works. But I show this picture because there's a balance that you need as you're riding your bike. And many of you know this who have ridden bikes before. And if you've engaged in a conversation with me in the last two or three months, you know that I'm always trying to turn the conversation to my injured knee. So I'll take all small talk and turn it to my knee. So if someone's saying, it's raining out there today. Yeah, that weather, you know, actually when it rains, my knee, you know, it starts to act up. And I have to, you know, I'm just limping along. I'll take any conversation, any matter of time to talk to you about my injured knee. Never is it more prevalent than right here when I'm riding bikes. Some of you have, actually I've seen a few of you as we've ridden our bikes and you've thankfully haven't honked and uh, said anything about my uh, technique on the bike, or maybe you haven't watched me long enough, but do you have any idea how hard it is to ride a bike with just one leg (laughs) and how it looks? I'm trying to hang this knee out and trying to get my balance and hold on kids, I'll be right there. The balance just isn't there. And as I thought about that, and I thought about what we're going to just dive into here today, is that we need this balance of 
knowing the word and doing the word. This side say knowing the word. Knowing, knowing the, the word, word, doing, doing the, the word. Knowing no. the word, doing the word. Okay, we can close in prayer. You guys got it. <laughs> Good. Uh, I should say, though, and I should, probably shouldn't say this here, but uh, after this service, we didn't say there's going to be cake in the uh, Family Life Center for, to celebrate the graduates. So uh, you can think about that for the next 25 minutes as I deliver this sermon, and then you join us for cake. So here, as, with that as a backdrop, we're going to jump into James chapter 1. Our text for this morning is in your bulletin. It'll be on the screen, or you can just open the old-fashioned way, just open your Bible to James Here's James chapter 1, verses 19 to 27. Uh, Here's God's word for us this morning. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Verse 22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it. They will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure. Okay, I'm just going to read it down here. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Amen for God's word for us this morning. Let's pray and receive this word, and then I have a few things to comment about it. God, thanks for today. Thanks for the power of your word. Thank you that you are with us as we study it. We pray that in the coming moments you would allow us to receive it, that it would take it from our our heads to our hearts, and that influence our actions. Holy Spirit, we ask that you be with us today as we unpack this, that you would give us the faith to trust in you and then to do what you tell us to do. So we thank you for your great love. Join us today in your name. Amen. So a couple defining terms before we uh, do, give you a few points from this text. First, when we're talking about faith, very simply for this two-part series, is trusting and obeying God. Trusting God where he leads listening to his voice. Hebrews 11.1, 1, which Pastor Brian has been unpacking, Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So we're having faith. And then for James, works is this, a life of loving God and loving others. So we have faith and trust in God, and then it overflows in loving God and loving others. Here's Jesus says, you might remember his, he was asked what's the most important commandment and his answer to that. And Matthew says this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. So the overflow of our faith is a loving of others. It spills out into our neighbors, our neighborhoods, our schools, our worker, our co-workers. Every place we are, faith spills over. Again, James is not saying that our works will lead us to salvation is saying that our faith will spill over and true, genuine, biblical faith will be characterized by works, by the things that we do because of what Jesus has done for us. So I don't want you to be confused because it's never based on our performance for Christ. Our salvation is never based on our performance for God. It's based on Christ's performance for us. And James does know this, and he's saying that we have faith in that. It will spill over into our works. So now as we come to this text, you might have seen that there is uh, a concern of James that the believers that are scattered are being deceived, that there is deception happening. Because the enemy, he has a mission statement. It's to steal, kill, and destroy. And he wants to deceive. And so James in chapter 1, even further than what we just studied, is a concern that the believers are being de- uh, deceived Because I believe that the enemy's first thing that he wants to take from us is our joy. He'll try to steal our joy. 
Take joy from us so that we're not walking through life joyfully following the Lord. That's why James, at the start in chapter 1, we didn't read this, but it's there. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. So James is concerned that the enemy is first trying to steal joy. And I wonder today if anybody has come here today with the enemy trying to take your joy from you, trying to steal joy from you. The second thing that I think that he tries to take is our strength. Because if he can get our joy, and he can nab our strength, then he can lead us into deception. James is very much concerned with this in chapter 1, and I think we can be concerned with that today. Because in verse 12 he says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised. The enemy wants to get our joy, he wants to get our strength, and then he wants to deceive us. So what does James say about deception? In what areas is the enemy trying to deceive us that would be helpful for us as we come to this word to know the truth of this? So for the next few minutes, we're going to unpack where James is saying we're deceiving, and then he's going to give us a three-step process out of deception and into the word, to be doers of the word. So I want to highlight where, is, where can we be deceived, and then what does James say about how we can become doers of the word and get out of deception? So here it is. First area is in our identity. We can be deceived about our identity. Here's what the Bible says in James, just before the passage we just wrote. And just after, a passage about making sure that you're not saying your temptation is coming from God. Here's where we can be deceived in our identity. It says, don't be deceived. James is telling the people, don't be deceived. The enemy wants to get your identity. My dear brothers and sisters, every good, every perfect gift is from above. God wants good things for his kids, and we are his children. The enemy wants to tell us that the temptation is coming from him, that everything bad is coming from him. But God wants us to be reminded not to be deceived, because every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be kind of first fruits of all he created. So he chose us. So I wonder today if you just need to rest in the reality that God has chosen us, that we are his children, that he loves us deeply. The Bible tells us that he delights in us. The enemy wants to take our joy and our strength and then lead in deception by telling us that we're not his, that we're everything other than what God tells us we are. And so this morning, don't be deceived My dear brothers and sisters, every good and every perfect gift is from God. God desires for us to recognize as a father loves his kids, he loves us deeply, dearly beloved children. And James is interested in in the people to know this too. My dear brothers and sisters, dear, dear brothers and sisters, don't be deceived. He chose us. So today, maybe you just need to remember that you're chosen by him, a God who loves you. Here's what else the Bible tells us in 1 John 3. See what kind of great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. We're his children, our identity. Second thing that we can be deceived about, according to James, if it's written here, it's, it's good instruction for us. The second thing is our activity. Here's that famous verse we read earlier. Don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Don't just listen, because in just listening, you're deceiving yourself. In just knowing, you're riding the bike with one leg. you got to get the other leg moving. not going to move it, so I don't want you to see me fall down. Do what it says. Activity. We can be deceived into thinking that all we need to do is hear. But James is concerned for those that, to hear this. <clears throat> it's not just hearing. It's about doing as well. Knowing the word and doing the word. And so today, I wonder if some of us have been sitting on an idea, a thought, a talent, a gift that God desires for us to actually use, but we haven't had the encouragement or the boldness or the courage to, to use it and to do it. God is reminding us to know what he said about you and then do what he's calling you to do. Know it and do it, our activity. C.S. Lewis wrote in the screw tape letters this, this quote here. It says, the more, in this screw tape letters is a a book about a, a devil named uh, Wormwood, or sorry, 
a yeah, devil, devil named Screwtape writing to his nephew Wormwood, and he wrote this about tempting Christians and followers of the way. He said, the more often he feels without acting, or he feels something without doing something, the less he will ever be able to act. And in the long run, the less he will be able to feel. One more time, he said, the more, he, he, more often he feels without acting, the more he feels something or knows something but doesn't do it, the less he will ever be able to act. He'll just start feeling, feeling, knowing, feeling, and then eventually we'll stop feeling. And then there will be the deception that we talked about. The enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy, but the good news of the gospel is that Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly and forever. So we can be deceived, just like James is telling the people, they can be deceived in their identity, who God called them to be. You can be deceived in your activity. And the third area where James says you can be deceived is in words. Here's what it says. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves. So deception is there. With our words, we can be deceived. We can deceive ourselves by what we say. And in fact, our words matter. Jesus said this. He said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That our words are important. Our words matter. And James is saying that sometimes we let our words take over. We let our words just go without thinking. It says, out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth speaks. So we can be deceived about our identity, our activity, and our words. But we're not going to stay right in that location because James, and for the much of our time, we're going to turn it into what he says to us. But at the end of his uh, passage here this morning, you remember it said this. It said, uh, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Now, the major deception is to think, and the enemy wants to get us to think, that we can, in fact, keep ourselves from being polluted or stained by the world in our own strength. Or we can be, uh, keep ourselves from being stained by our sin in our own strength. That's not something that we can do. It is the gift of God. It is the grace that he has given us, and it's worth celebrating. So James is telling them, don't be deceived about this either. This is something that God has done for us. And in fact, he would have remembered Jesus telling about this fact. He would have remembered uh, learning from the Old Testament where it says this in Zechariah. Here's what the Bible says in Zechariah, which I want to highlight here because it's exciting for us. It says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord has chosen Jerusalem. Rebuke you is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire. Now watch this, because it's an it's a, uh, example for us to see and to be encouraged and to uh, learn from. Joshua was, was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Joshua could not take off his own filthy clothes. They said, Find garments on you. It is a picture for us of what God has done for us. The filthiness of the sin, the stains from the sin in the world could not be taken away by us, but by God through Jesus. Take off the filthy clothes. Instead, put on the fine garments that I give you. And it's because of what Jesus has done for us that we can be unpolluted. We can be stain free from our sins because Jesus took that for us. It is a truth that is powerful for us once we embrace it. So James is telling, don't be deceived about these things, your identity, your activity, your words, and then ultimately don't be deceived about your, how you can find Jesus. It's God giving you this gift of him. You can't do it in your own works. You have to believe that what Jesus has done for you removes the stain of sin, takes it away, and it's worthy of celebrating. Now, what does James do for us? And this is where we'll spend the remainder of our time. As I said, he gives us a three-step process to getting out of deception and becoming doers of the word that I want to share with you here this morning. The first is this. In order for us to be doers of the word, to be out of deception and pointed to the truth, God's word must be heard carefully. We must listen to it. Here's what James says again. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. 
Everyone should be quick to listen. That's what James says, quick to listen. I mean, we should, in order for us to be quick to listen, something else has to stop. Talking. All the other volumes need to be turned down. In our house, Cody and our kids will always have the TV turned up so loud that I can't process one single thought. (laughs) And so the three words I always say, turn it down. It's one of my more famous sayings. (laughs) Turn it down. I try different ways of saying it. Turn it down. Turn it down. Turn it down. Can't hear anything. And in order for us to hear carefully God's word, other things need to be turned down. We need to turn it down. Other volumes that are creeping in that are too loud for us need to be turned down so that we can hear carefully what God is saying. Now, Paige is our one-year-old, and she's just starting the goo-goo-ga-ga phase, where she's saying some words, and uh, as with all babies, the celebration when we think that we've heard actually an actual word is large. So for me, if I hear them say anything resembling closely to, to dad, dad, daddy, dad, do, dad, da, you just said daddy, and I just have a big celebration, even though she probably wasn't saying that yet. But I still celebrate because I want to hear that. I love hearing what she's saying, regardless of what it is. And sometimes she just wants to be heard, so she's just, ba 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 She's saying something, but I want to hear her. And the reality is, is when we, uh, we love to listen to those we love. And the same is true with God. When we turn down everything else, we listen, we're quick to listen, we'll hear God say some things to us. And then we can be encouraged and refreshed and excited about what he's saying to us because we quickly listened. We turned the other things down. What is it that we need to turn down, according to James in our word here on the screen? Our speaking, and then he says our anger. Slow to become angry. Because when we're angry, we're not listening. So James puts those things together because it's a truth that anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires And when we're angry, we can't listen. We can't listen to what God has to say for us because that's one of the volumes that goes high-pitched, takes over, so we can't listen. He wants us to be quick to listen. God is the same for us. Quick to listen. So the Bible must be heard carefully. Uh, Ashley and I had a weird conversation recently, and it wasn't about my knee. That's probably why we had it. And uh, (laughs) we were sitting for breakfast somewhere, and she just mentioned... She said, you know, when we're old and if I die before you, will you still just go out for breakfast by yourself? I didn't know how to answer that, so I said something about my knee, I'm sure. <laughs> I said, I, I don't know if I'm going to make it because my knee is so that long. Uh, but that same week, uh, randomly, and the internet is just great for this, something came on my timeline just said, top 10 reasons why uh, men die younger than women. So I clicked on it with this conversation in mind, and here's, I didn't read it, I just saw this. <laughs> and uh, so apparently, apparently some men will hear something and then just either just go right at it without, just, honey, the wall needs to be painted, on it. Can't reach it, but I'm on it. But this was the, the picture, I didn't read the rest, but I got captivated by this picture that I wanted to share it with you here today. Because as I said, Here's how. I said James gave us a three-step process, but apparently some men will do a two-step process where they'll just hear and do or hear and not do. There's a second step in the process that God, that God gives us through his word. And so there's just, if you ever have some time to yourself, there's a ton of photos like this that are uh, worth looking at and have fun seeing why men die before uh, women. So take that in for a moment. So... If, <laughs> He thinks it might be Doug. You're viral. You've gone viral. Uh, So first, it's heard carefully. There's a second step to the process that's very important for us. It's not just to hear it, but we actually have to process it. We have to actually think about what we're hearing. So it's heard carefully. God's word must be heard carefully. Secondly, it's got to be accepted humbly. We've got to receive it. We've got to receive what we're hearing from God. means that we need to take more time. We're quick to listen to it. We need to take time with it so that we can process it and accept it humbly. These aren't my words. These are directly from what God's word says to us this morning. 
get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. So we can humbly accept what God's word says for us. So first we listen to it. Then we uh, put it to the test to God's word to see, is this something that is consistent with what God would be saying to us? Or other people thinking the same way, hearing God in this same capacity, that we would accept God's word, let it sink into our hearts and influence our action. The number one thing that we need for this is time. We need time to listen, and then we need time to receive it, to accept it. And time is the one thing that hurried people do not have. Many of us are hurried, going to this or to that, every moment of our day hustling. And God says to sometimes we need to take a time out, hear his word, accept it humbly. And part of humbly accepting it is to get rid of anything that's in the way from us hearing. For James, it says, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. That means we let God's spirit direct our hearts and clean us out so we can uh, hear properly. Part of accepting humbly is doing uh, the work that God calls us to do when he's pointing out sin, pointing out things that are blocking us from hearing. Sin is the one thing that does block us from hearing God's voice. So James is concerned that we know that, that we get rid of all moral filth that is so prevalent and humbly accept The word. So the three-step process. Hearing it carefully. Accepting God's word humbly. And then third, practicing it faithfully. God's word must be practiced faithfully. Meaning we continue to do it and do it and do it. Here's what the James says for us as we read. Don't merely listen to the word and deceive yourselves. You got to do it. And the thing about practice is that sometimes in your practice, you will find that you might fail and you might fall. But God desires for us to, even when we fail, even when we fall, to keep going forward, to keep doing it, to keep practicing, to keep uh, going where he leads us, to keep listening quickly, accepting humbly, and then going where he leads. And when I was younger, practice was important because I always thought I'd be playing basketball everywhere I went. And so I played in my driveway, day and night, early in the morning, late at night. We'd have neighbors tell us, can you stop, please? Can you turn it down? We're trying to sleep over here. And one day I got this brand new Nike basketball, and I've said this before, because it's, it's obviously I'm still working on it. I got this brand new Nike basketball, and I went out to the, park, to the driveway, and I'm just shooting my hoops. That's what I do. Boom. Boom. Boom, that's me making it. Boom. my Boom. I actually had someone standing there just to say that, so I'd be encouraged. Boom. Boom. And so as I was shooting with this Nike basketball, and legend has it, this was the last time that I missed. I took a shot and missed. And my Nike basketball went bubbling down the driveway. And a school bus came by. And I thought, yes, a school bus of all people will stop. They have the little stop thing on the sign. They get everybody stopped so I can get my ball. The school bus ran over my ball, popped it. And I said, I don't know what I said, but I probably chased that bus down the street looking for my ball ball or a payback or if someone on the bus had another ball they could give me? Seriously, why would a school bus driver drive over with a ball? It actually popped so loud I thought the whole bus was going to go over. And I said, uh-oh. But here's the thing. My ball, if that ball popped, what happened? I got another ball. Practice more. Till that ball popped. Practice more. And for us, sometimes we just need to get out and do what God says for us, even if that means that sometimes things aren't going to go your way. You just keep doing it and doing it, going, listening, accepting, doing, listening, accepting, doing. James is concerned that the way out of deception and the way that the enemy wants to deceive us, the way to beat that is to know the truth of God's word, to listen to it quickly, 
accept it humbly, and then do it. So I want to encourage you today that you get back out there and practice God's word. Practice even listening to his word, what he's saying to you. Taking time to quiet all else so that we can hear what he's saying and accept it. Maybe he's saying to us, even in this room today, that there are some things in our lives that need to be uh, dealt with, need to be put aside to get rid of so that we can hear his word properly. Because here's how James says, remember, he says, all these things that I've said there, and then he says he gives us an illustration, which is great because we love illustrations. He says, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. We can all understand what that means. You look at the mirror, and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. So, for example, if you went and looked in the mirror and you saw that you had something on your face, but you just kept looking at yourself, and then you left and said, oh, I look, I'm looking good today. And you walk out with that food on your face. You just forgot what you just looked at. James is saying to this, anyone who does that is foolish. But whoever looks intently into the law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they'll be blessed in what they do. So God reminding us again to hear, to rest in his love for us, but to allow his love for us to spill over in the things that we do, our actions, the way in which we respond to God's love by loving others. Because in fact, the closer that we get to God, the closer we get to one another, the closer we hear from him, the more he wants us to be uh, influencing others. Now again, James, the little brother of Jesus, wasn't just making this stuff up. He was hearing it from Jesus, who is the way, the truth, the life. He was hearing it from Jesus, because here's what Jesus said in Luke eleven twenty-eight: 28. Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Know what God is saying and do it. Knowing and doing, knowing and doing, knowing and doing. This is what... Uh, our faith in God is all about that we know how much he loves us deeply and then we do what he's called us to do. Because James will tell us faith that doesn't have works is a dead faith. Faith believing in God, trusting, the assurance, the confidence in what we hope for, uncertainty of what we don't see. We can have this faith and it will spill over into others that we would know and do. Let's pray together. God, thanks for this day. Thanks once again for the power of your word. We pray that as we uh, even gather for the remaining minutes that you, through your spirit, would speak to our hearts that if there are things that we need to rid ourselves of, that you would make us aware of that. Or maybe you just need to make some of us aware of how deeply loved we are as your children, that you love us deeply, have great plans for us, and that you desire for our faith to overflow, or your love for us to overflow into others. Help us to be people who are marked by our faith that shows that we love you and love others in the things that we do. So we thank you in this day, in the powerful name of Jesus, amen.